Hello, this is Dr. Hena Asil, and this is a paper for Combined Science of June 2022. So let us take a look at the questions and discuss the answers. The first question was, uh, figure 1.1 is a diagram of the gas exchange system in humans. Identify the part labeled P. So, of course, if you look at what is P, P is that thing that looks like small uh, sacks. That is the alveoli in the lung. Identify the part labeled Q. Where is Q? Well, Q, that is the one called diaphragm. Okay. Tobacco smoke contains carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide binds to hemoglobin. Explain how this affects respiration in the body. Of course, you should realize that the hemoglobin is something in the cytoplasm of the red blood cells. Usually, it attaches to oxygen to transport it to the body cells. So if you have carbon monoxide in the blood, then the carbon monoxide will attach to the hemoglobin so less oxygen is transported by the red blood cells and less respiration occurs in the body cells. Then he's asking goblet cells are found in the tissue of the gaseous exchange surface or gas exchange system. Explain how goblet cells protect the gas exchange system from particles in the air. Remember that the lining of your respiratory system has two types of cells, goblet cell and ciliated cell. The goblet cell is the one that secretes mucus. Now, the mucus traps the dust and microbes in the air coming into the respiratory system. And then the cilia on the ciliated cells pushes the mucus out of the respiratory system. So the function of the goblet cells is to secrete mucus that traps dust and microbes. The next question says, figure 1.1 shows some data on chronic obstructive pulmonary disorder, which we call COPD, in people of different age groups. So he has columns for males, columns for females in different age groups groups and then he's saying identify the percentage of females aged 60 to 69 with COPD. Please read the questions properly, uh, determine what he wants and please find what he's looking for. So you're looking for females, females are the lighter columns, Ages 6 to 6, 60 to 69. Where is 60 to 69? So this is 6% of the people. Do we understand this? Then he says, describe two trends shown in the figure. Okay, what can you see in the figure? Well, you can see that the percentage of people having COPD increases with age. So as the age group increases, the columns become bigger. That means the percentage of people increase. Also, if we're comparing males with females, more males have COPD than females in each uh, age group. Question two says, the outer shell electrons in atoms of elements X, Y, and Z are shown. State the group of the periodic table in which element Y is placed. Where is Y? This is Y. How do I know what is the group? You should know that the group number is the same as number of electrons in outer shell. So how many electrons does it have in outer shell? It has seven. That means it belongs to group seven. State the charge on the ion formed from an atom of element Z. Where is element Z? That's element Z. What does he mean by charge on the ion? That means if it is going to gain or lose electrons, will it have positive charge or will it have negative charge? Okay, that is determined by number of electrons in outer shell. So how many electrons in outer shell does it have? It has six. That means it needs to gain two electrons in order to have a complete outer shell and that means the charge on the ion will be minus two because it needs to gain two electrons to have a full outer shell. Table 2.1 shows some information about substances which contain these elements x, y, and z and he's saying complete to show me whether each one is an element or a compound. 
Well, how do we know? Remember that elements have all the atoms the same. Compounds will have different elements chemically combined together. So X2Z has two different elements, so that's a compound. X2 just has one type of element. It has X, so that's an element. Z has only one type of atoms, so that is an element. Okay, draw a dot and cross diagram to show the outer shell electrons in the molecules of Z2. How do we draw dot and cross to show outer shell electrons? Well, we looked at Z and we said Z has six electrons in its outermost shell. That means each one needs two electrons and that means if two atoms come together, each one will share two electrons with the next one. And that means it will have four of its electrons left after sharing the two pairs of electrons. So each one will have four far away. You don't draw them between the two atoms. And the only ones that you draw between the two atoms are two electrons from one atom and two electrons from the other. A student thinks that element X is lithium. Use the information in table two one to show why element X cannot be lithium. Well, when I look at the table, I find that he says that X2 is covalent. Now, if it is lithium, will it form covalent bonds with itself? Remember that lithium is in group one. It's a metal. Metals do not form covalent molecules. So it cannot be lithium. Okay, identify element X. Element X is something that has only one electron. So what do you think it is? That must be height. Figure 3 1 shows a man pushing a shopping trolley forward along a level surface. Figure 3 2, which is the other diagram, shows three of the forces acting on the trolley as the man pushes it. Now draw an arrow to show the direction of the friction force on the trolley and label it R. Well, you should know that friction is a force that is in opposite direction to the movement. So if he's pushing the trolley so that it is moving towards the right, and that's P, then the friction will be in the opposite direction, and that's where R is. Okay? The trolley has a mass of 15 kilograms. The gravitational force, which is G, is 10 newton per kilogram. Calculate the magnitude of S. You should realize what is S. S is the force due to gravity, that is weight. So weight is equal to the mass times gravitational force. Please memorize these equations. Weight is equal to mg. m is 15 kilogram and g is 10. That means S is 150 newton. What about Q? What is the magnitude of Q? Well, you can see that the trolley is moving forward. It's not moving up or moving down. And that means Q must be equal to S. So if S was 150, then Q also is 150 because it is equal and opposite to S. Figure 3.3 shows a speed time graph of the motion of the trolley. Now use this to calculate kinetic energy at one second. The trolley has a mass of 15 kilograms. Again, how do we get kinetic energy? You should know. Kinetic energy is half mv squared. Now, what is the speed or v at one second? It's 0.4. So if kinetic energy is half mv squared, then that is half times the mass, which is 15 times the velocity or the speed. Remember that V is the same as speed. So the speed at one second is 0.4 from the graph. So that is 0.4 to the power 2. That comes out to be 1.2 joule. Use figure 3.3 to calculate acceleration between 2 seconds and 4 seconds. Where is 2 seconds and 4 seconds? Can you see that? What is acceleration? Acceleration is change in speed over time. 
So between two seconds and four seconds, what was the change in speed from point A to point four? And the change in time is from four to two. So the difference between each of these, and you divide them, that comes out to be point two. Now, what is the unit for acceleration? Meter per second squared. Between four and 10 seconds, the man pushes the trolley with a constant force of 25 newtons. Calculate the work done. Well, you should know. First of all, in physics, the physics part, you have to memorize the equation. So what is work? You should know that work is force times distance. Okay, the force we have, 25 newtons. Now, what is the distance? Well, we look at the speed time graph. And you should realize that distance is speed times time. The speed at that point from 4 to 10 seconds, the speed was constant. It was 0.8 times the time. What is the time? The time is from 4 to 10. So that is a time of 6 seconds. So that comes out to be 4.8 meters. Use that to get the work. The work is the force, which is 25 times the 4.8, which is the distance. That gives us 120 joules. Okay, good. Question four. Figure 4.1 is a diagram of a wind pollinated flower, and he says draw a line to identify the part where fertilization takes place. You should know that in any flower, fertilization takes place in the ovary. So, where is the ovary here? The ovary is that part from which the feathery things are coming out. So that's the opening. Now, state two pieces of evidence that show that this flower is wind pollinated. We said, what in the diagram? Remember, he's saying from the figure. So don't tell me something that is not clear in the figure. So you should realize this is wind pollinated because first of all, it has long feathery stigma and it has large anther hanging out. Okay, plants synthesize carbohydrates by the process of photosynthesis. Complete the balanced equation for photosynthesis. Remember, you're required to know the balanced equation and the word equation. So what reacts in photosynthesis? You should realize that carbon dioxide and water react to give what? To give glucose plus oxygen. Now, in presence of what? What should I write on the arrow? In presence of light or sunlight. Explain the role of chlorophyll in the synthesis of carbohydrates. What is the role of chlorophyll? What does chlorophyll do? You should realize that chlorophyll is the green part or the one inside chloroplast in the uh, cells of the leaf. And the function of the chlorophyll is to absorb light energy and convert it to chemical energy. And this is used to make glucose and oxygen. Figure 4.2 shows how transpiration rate and temperature change during the day. Explain the effect of temperature on changes of transpiration. Do you remember what was transpiration? Well, from 12 to 18, he has transpiration rate, first of all, is doing what? It's decreasing. And you should realize that transpiration is what? Transpiration is when water vapor uh, diffuses out of the stomata in the leaves. That's what we called transpiration. So explain the effect of temperature on changes of transpiration rate between 12 and 18 hours. Well, I can see that the transpiration is decreasing and the temperature is decreasing. Can you see that the dotted lines represent temperature? So we can say that transpiration rate decreases. So first of all, he says, the effect of temperature, so you have to tell me whether it's decreasing or increasing. Of course, in the diagram, it's decreasing. Now, explain. The temperature decreases, so less evaporation of water from the mesophyll cells, less diffusion of water vapor out of the stomata. Water is lost through stomata. Explain why stomata are important for photosynthesis. What are stomata? Stomata are the tiny holes usually at the bottom of the leaves. Now, how, the, how is it important for photosynthesis? And this is where 
carbon dioxide gas can diffuse in. So remember that carbon dioxide gas diffuses in through the stomata and this is needed for photosynthesis. A pH meter is an instrument which measures pH. The tip of the meter is dipped into a solution. The pH of the solution is displayed on a small screen. So that is the pH meter. But then he says the pH values of some aqueous solutions are also measured using universal indicator paper in addition to pH meter. And he has these um, values that he obtained. So you notice that when we use universal indicator paper, we have a, a certain pH, 12, 5, 1. But when we use a pH meter, it is more accurate. Can you see? It doesn't say 12. It says 11.6. Uh, it doesn't say 5, it says 5.3, 5.5, and so on. So it is more accurate, gives to one decimal place, for example. So first of all, he's saying, describe the procedure used to measure the pH of a solution using universal indicator paper. How do I determine the pH of a solution using pH, uh, uh, universal indicator paper? We said we should insert the paper into the solution and then compare the color to the chart. He usually gives me a chart that says if the color is this, it's pH 1, pH 5, pH 12, and so on. So how do you use universal indicator paper to determine pH? Insert the paper into the solution and compare the color to the chart. Then he's saying suggest two advantages of using a pH meter rather than the universal indicator paper. We just said that when I use the pH meter, it is more accurate. It will give me, instead of just 11, it's giving me 11 point something. And another thing is that the pH meter can be reused. It can be used again and again and again. While the universal indicator paper, each paper use it once. You cannot use the paper again. Farmers use solid ammonium nitrate and solid ammonium sulfate to improve the growth of crops. Aqueous ammonia and dilute sulfuric acid react to make ammonium sulfate. Now, write the balanced equation. Remember that to form ammonium something, we react ammonia with an acid. So if I want ammonium sulfate, that is ammonia with sulfuric acid. And you need to balance. In order to balance, you need to put it two in front of the ammonia. So just the name of the compound that reacts with ammonia to form ammonium nitrate. So we said if I want to make ammonium sulfate, it reacts ammonia with sulfuric acid. So if I want to make ammonium nitrate, then I react ammonia with nitric acid. Describe how solid ammonium sulfate is obtained from an aqueous ammonium solution. So I have a solution, ammonium sulfate dissolved in water, and I want to get the solid. So basically, I want to get the crystals. Remember that what we do is we heat the solution first to point of crystallization to evaporate some of the water. Then we cool, it forms crystals, and then I filter the crystals. So this is how you explain crystallization. The earth is heated by infrared radiation from the sun. State the speed at which the infrared radiation travels from the sun to the earth. Remember that the uh, speed of uh, infrared radiation or the speed of light coming from the sun is 3 times 10 to the 8 meter per second. Then he says the infrared radiation takes 8 minutes and 20 seconds to travel from the sun to the earth. Use your answer to calculate the distance in kilometers. So I know the speed, I know the time, I want to get the distance. How do we get distance? Distance is speed times time. So the speed that we have in meter per second times the time has to be total second. So if I have 8 minutes and 20 seconds, what is the total number of seconds? Each minute is 60 seconds, so 8 times 60, plus 20, that makes up 500 seconds. But then my answer here is in meters, and he is writing that he needs it in kilometers. So I still need to divide by 1,000 to get the distance in 
kilometers. Okay, figure 6, 1 shows an incomplete electromagnetic spectrum, right infrared radiation in its correct place. You have to know this order of spectrum. Gamma rays, X-rays, ultraviolet, visible, infrared, microwave, radio. You have to know this order. So if he's saying I want to put infrared, where is infrared? Infrared is before the microwaves. Okay? Figure 6 2 shows how an infrared ray from the sun is refracted as it enters the Earth's atmosphere. Now, why? Explain why the ray is refracted as it moves from space into Earth's atmosphere. Remember, why do we have refraction of light? This is because when the uh, wave goes from one medium to another that is different density, then the wave refracts. So the speed of the wave changes when the medium is denser. Figure 6.3 shows sunlight shining on a brick wall. One half of the wall is painted white, the other half is painted black. Explain why the temperature of the bricks painted black increases faster than the temperature of the bricks painted white. So the black one will be hotter or the temperature rises faster. Why? You should remember that when something is black, it absorbs more of the radiation, while something that is white will reflect the radiation. So it will absorb less. The white absorbs less. Figure 7 1 shows part of the human alimentary canal. Identify the part labeled Z. What is Z in the diagram? That is a liver. Complete this definition of chemical digestion. Chemical digestion is the breakdown of large what molecules? Large insoluble molecules into smaller soluble molecules. Amylase and lipase are found in the alimentary canal. Compare similarities and differences between functions of amylase and lipase. So what is similar between amylase and lipase? That they're both enzymes. So they both break down large food molecules. But what is the difference between amylase and lipase? Do you remember what amylase does? Amylase breaks down starch into maltose, while lipase, lipase breaks down fats into fatty acids and glycerol. So the difference between them is that Amylase breaks down starch, lipase breaks down fats. Digested nutrients move out of the alimentary canal into the bloodstream. State the component of blood that transports digested nutrients. What is in blood? Can you see blood? Blood contains red blood cells. What do they do? Transport oxygen. White blood cells. What do they do? They protect from microbes. These are part of the immune system. Platelets, can you see the platelets? The platelets are tiny little pieces of cells and they uh, help in blood clotting. When you have a wound then it closes. Now what is the liquid part of blood? Can you see what the liquid part of blood is called? It's called plasma. That is what transports the soluble molecules that are obtained from digestion. Iron is extracted from hematite in a blast furnace. We have three equations. State which equation, one, two, or three, represents a reaction in which a carbon compound acts as a reducing agent. Where in which equation do we have something that has carbon that is acting as a reducing agent? Well, if you look at equation three, you will find that the carbon monoxide was oxidized. It took oxygen from the iron 3 oxide and became carbon dioxide. So the carbon monoxide is a reducing agent. Name two gases that are produced in these equations and describe a health or environmental problem. What are the gases produced? Carbon monoxide? What's the problem with carbon monoxide? It's poisonous or toxic. What is the other gas? Carbon dioxide. What's the problem with carbon dioxide? It causes global warming. Now, Fe2O3 contains the oxide iron. State the charge on iron, Fe. What is the valency of iron in this? 
it is Fe2O3, that means the charge on the iron is plus 3. Then this question says, table 8.1 lists the method of extraction of iron and some other metals from their ores. So he's saying iron is obtained by heating with carbon, aluminium and sodium by electrolysis, zinc by heating with carbon. First of all, he's asking, identify the metal that has the greatest tendency to form positive ions. You have to remember the one that has greatest dent tendency to form positive ions is the more reactive metal. So which of these is more reactive? Sodium. This is the most reactive of the elements in the list. Then he says copper and magnesium are extracted from their ores. Suggest so a method of extraction for copper and for magnesium. I'm going to remind you again that the reactivity series determines the method of extraction. So, um, any element more reactive than carbon, so potassium, sodium, calcium, magnesium, aluminium, these cannot be uh, obtained by reduction with carbon or reaction with carbon. This is because the metal is more reactive than the carbon and will not be displaced by it. But any metal less reactive than carbon, zinc, iron, tin, copper, mercury, silver, gold, all of these can be obtained by extraction, um, by reduction with carbon. So if we're looking for copper, where is copper? Copper is less reactive than carbon. So I can obtain it by reduction with carbon because it is less reactive than carbon so it will be displaced by it but magnesium is more reactive than carbon so i need to use electrolysis since magnesium is more reactive than carbon and cannot be displaced by it this question shows an electric circuit and he has battery Attached to switch, variable resistor, voltmeter, lamp, and ammeter. The switch is turned on, so that means he's going to close the switch, and the variable resistor adjusted until the voltmeter reading is 6 volts. The ammeter reading is 0.75 amperes. What is the resistance of the lamp? Again, you have to memorize equations in physics. How do we get resistance of a lamp? We should know that resistance is voltage over current. R is V over I, or you should know that V is IR, so R is V divided by I. V is the voltmeter reading, I is the ammeter reading, and that gives me 8 ohms. The unit for resistance is ohm. Calculate the power. Of the lamp. So if you look at the information he gives me, he says the variable resistor is adjusted until the voltmeter reading is 6 volts, the ammeter reading is 0.75 amperes. How do we get power? You should know that in an electric circuit, the power is equal to IV. So you multiply the current, 0.75, by the voltage, this gives you 4.5 watt. Remember, the unit for uh, power is what? And then the last part of the exam, he says, complete the circuit diagram for the circuit shown. So he already drew the battery for you. He drew the ammeter. He drew the lamp, and you need to complete it. So what are we supposed to put? We're supposed to put the switch, variable resistor, all of these in series. And then the voltmeter is in parallel with the lamp. So voltmeter parallel to the lamp. And then the rest of the circuit is a meter, battery, switch, and variable resist. Okay, so that's the end of this paper. I hope this was clear and useful to you. Thank you for listening.